All right, last presentation of the day, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, adjourn. Um, so license validation efforts. We're, we're going to intersperse throughout the week uh, each day, um, talk about a couple of validation studies that we have done in LISIM. Uh, they're really fun. They're a really nice way to end the day, uh, get us thinking about it and get us kind of excited. And they're interesting. I'm going to be talking about uh, two, two events that occurred, uh, Kelly Barnes and, and Mal Passe, dam failures. They're both dam failures that occurred in the 70s. One was the 70s, one was the 50s. Um, that is the real problem, right? The problem statement is, how can we be confident that license is giving us results that are reasonable? That's the, that's the fun. We're, we're talking about fictitious events that are occurring in the future um, that haven't occurred. And we're talking about all these different parameters and what impacts life loss and our fatality rate curves. There's a lot of moving parts here. How can we have confidence that they're giving us results that are reasonable? And so we have to, we have to look at historic events and try to match the inputs let the model do its thing and see where the outputs lie. Model validation. So how close are we to the actual results? But then second, what about our process? In the core of engineers, at least, we have a standard process for, the, for events that haven't happened yet, looking at ample warning scenarios, minimal warning scenarios. How well does our process do at getting close to the, the, what actually happened? So these are the two fundamental questions. One is model validation. We want to validate that license is doing what we hope it's doing. And two, process validation. Does our process get us to a point where we can be comfortable with the decisions that we're making based off these results? Like I said, I'll be talking about two events, Kelly Barnes Dam, 1977, and then uh, Mal Dam. Kelly Dams, Kelly Dams, Kelly Barnes Dam failure occurred in 1977 in Georgia. Uh, Tacoma Falls is the uh, the famous falls that that where it occurred. This is a college, a very small study area, so it provided a, a unique scenario where where we were able to capture very detailed information about each family, each each group of people that were submitted to this flooding and what happened to them, where they were when the flooding arrived. How, what kind of warning they got, where they went afterwards, like how everything ended up. We have very good information because it's a relatively small area. Uh, the data that we got, uh, USGS um, HA613 maps. So there's maps from USGS on the extents of the inundation. We use those, actually, Brennan Beam here uh, developed the, uh, the model, the Lifeson model for this, and he created the RAS model, a uh, two-dimensional RAS model that simulates the, the dam breach that occurred. Use the extents from USGS as well as um, building uh, un, uh, knowledge about what buildings got destroyed and what buildings got wet and the extents of which they were wet, like depths on those buildings. Use those all to calibrate his model to make sure that he's doing a good job of replicating the event. And then there's, a, there's an excellent book called uh, Dam Break in Georgia, Sadness and Joy at Tacoa Falls. This book is, it provides a really, really detailed analysis of what happened and, and firsthand experiences of, of what was going on during the flood and was provided very valuable information on how to get structure information, population information, and so on. All right, looking at the area, um, I mentioned his name before, Paul Richer. He's done a lot of good research for us when he was with the Corps of Engineers. He went through and, uh, and did an outline in Google Earth of every structure that occurred and then color coded them associated with their, their damage level. So red would be totally destroyed, uh, blue is, is partially destroyed, yellow is partially destroyed, blue is minor damage, and then finally green is no damage at all. So you can see here the devastation that occurred right through there. Um, pretty small area, fairly low number of structures that were impacted. So it became, it's a really nice bite-sized piece that we could study. What we know, what we know about what happened. Population at risk was around 150 people, give or take. And one thing that's important to know about looking at these historic studies is that nothing is ever certain. We never know exactly how many people lost their lives, or at least I haven't seen a case history yet where we know exactly how many people lost their lives. We don't know exactly how many people were there. There's always some uncertainty about these numbers. And that uncertainty varies based on the study. Uh, there was no formal warning. So this happened in the middle of the night. It's a, a dam that was no longer being operated. It's been, it's been left, left. So 
could cause flooding. They happened to be there, uh, but they weren't able to actually provide much warning. Uh, road network was based on historic imagery. Uh, although this was no, uh, one of the situations where there was no warning, so there wasn't much of a need for a road network. However, we wanted to include it in the model because if life sims is sent, and sending everyone out on road and they're reaching safety, we want to know that, right? We want to know if life sims way wrong. Um, so we ended, we imported the road network. There is a report of somebody who did, was able to evacuate by vehicle of those 150. They, they were able to, to see water coming and get enough of a warning where they jumped in their car and drove out. Inundation extents and structural damage that, like I said, those were used for the, for the, for the hydraulic calibration. And then we use the building footprints for the structure inventory. And then that book that I was mentioning uh, was used for historic accounts of population in each structure. So that's what we know. It's really kind of nice and, I mean, it's a terrible event, but it, for, for the purposes of validating this model, it's a nice isolated small study area where we have a lot of confidence about what happened in e for each of these groups, each of these structures, each of these families. 39 direct fatalities occurred from that flood. So it's pretty scary. Out of 150 population at risk, 40 people lost their life of them almost. That's a pretty high percentage. All right, so how do we do it? Model validation, we had, there was no warning, so we model it as such, right? There are some environmental cues, so we put in a little bit of a, of a warning to get a few people to be aware early on. We have all the population in the places, the structures based on their structure types and so on. And we run it through the model and, and we do pretty well. Historical count was 39. Uh, our median life, si life sim result was 49, minimum 19 and 69. So it's within the bounds, uh, but we did, a, we did a, overestimate a little bit. Life sim did overestimate. Why is that? Let's dig into it a little bit. Um, forest hall, as you can see here, forest hall is a, a multi-story structure that's split level. So it's kind of on a hillside and the back end of the, of the structure is up on a hill and actually never got wet. But on the bottom side, on the low side, these, these, all these windows got busted out and there was people inside there. So some people lost their life in there. Um, remember, LiveSim doesn't consider a structure in, in all of its parts. It looks at that structure as a point and the depths and velocities are occurring at that point, remember? And, in, and it's assuming everyone's gonna get to the top livable floor. So, for this structure, it's concrete, it's on the edge of floodwaters. Do you think LifeSim said it was destroyed? No. And if it wasn't destroyed and it's like four stories tall, do you think LifeSim said that everyone in there was a high hazard? Where they were stuck in their room and they got trapped. There were some life loss occurs. So three people lost their life in that situation. LifeSim said, on average, zero. Almost every iteration of LifeSim sampling said zero people are gonna lose their life in that structure. So this is important. LifeSim doesn't do a good job of accounting for very large structures where hydraulic characteristics change throughout the structure. One way you can handle that is you can break this structure up into multiple structures, to locations to, to separate out the hydraulic characteristics and maybe get a little bit more realistic result. It's one place that it missed, but it did catch it on a couple of iterations. It did happen to capture that historical account. The Ebby House. This is, a, this is an interesting one. So Ebby House over here, this is a structure got washed off its foundation, got pushed aside. The family inside got pushed out of the structure, got washed out of the structure. They were all able to scramble back into the structure floated to another area where it just rather sat in an eddy. So they all survived. It's pretty amazing. This is a structure that got wiped out, washed off. They got washed out of it and they scrambled back in somehow and were able to survive inside the structure. Pretty, pretty amazing. Life sim said on average, everyone in there is going to lose their life. Very high. The life sim saying this is a structure that lost its stability. The people in there are in a high hazard situation. The fatality rate is going to be pretty high. So on average, or in the median, everyone in there lost their life. However, the historical count was zero, and we did capture a few iterations where zero occurs. So this is a situation where LifeSim overestimates, right? It doesn't account for the ability of that resiliency of people to that level. 
Trailerville, going a little bit farther downstream, look at the destruction here. This was a, uh, uh, a collection of trailers where it's um, student housing, mostly families, family students, uh, you know, graduate students. As you can see, there's quite a bit of, of destruction that occurred. Almost everything was wiped out. You can see where the, uh, some of the trailers were sitting before, just by, by the ground, uh, no longer there. Life loss was about the same as we we're looking at Ebby House. Some of the structures were completely destroyed and they were, some people miraculously survived and so on. But what I wanna really bring your attention to on this one is the structure stability. So they were all given mobile home stability criteria. And based on the depths and velocities that occurred, these big red, red squares represent total collapse, collapse to every single iteration of life sim. And then as, as those iterations go down that they collapse, it starts going to a smaller squares and, and lighter green color. So the, the idea here is that out of a thousand iterations in Lysen, these big red squares collapse every single time. That lines up really well with the red buildings that were collapsed. get a little bit of damage, partial damage of those structures. So LifeSim is doing a really good job in this case of estimating if a building actually collapsed or not in a flood. And that's really valuable information to have. If you just don't even think about life loss alone, you're just thinking about structural stability and the ability of a structure to be able to withstand that flooding. LifeSim did a very good job of being able to estimate that. What about the process validation? So we just talked about model validation. I'm feeling pretty good about it. LifeSim overestimated a bit on average, but it captured it within its bounds. And we can explain why it missed, where it, when it missed. Um, but what about our process? So we put in our, our, our scenario for our process validation. We have an ample warning scenario and a minimum warning scenario. And our ample warning scenario, underestimated, as expected, right? If they had ample warning, a lot fewer people would have lost their life. And then when we put our minimum, and you notice another thing I want to point out is the bounds are much higher. That's because when we do our process validation, when we first step into a study, we say, you know, we really don't know how well the emergency managers are prepared. We really don't know how that warning is going to spread. So we use really wide ranges of uncertainty. So you see those wide ranges of uncertainty being reflected here. For our minimum warning scenario, the life loss actually went up. It actually said more people would have lost their life. Why is that? Looking at our, um, our hydrograph and our warning issuance area, that warning issuance delay, if our, if our hazard identification times is two hours prior to the time of breach, and that warning issuance delay is saying, you know, that warning might, they might actually send out that evacuation order way after, it's actually sending out the evacuation order potentially in some iterations, three, four, five hours after the flood has even passed through it. And so that's why you're seeing higher life loss because in reality what happened is that there was some environmental cues, there was some information to where some people were able to take action and get out due to those environmental cues. So that's a little bit different. In, in reality, the warning was never issued, but people were starting to get warned right at the breach. Versus, and that allowed some people to be able to evacuate. Whereas in this scenario, it's putting a lot of samples out here in our process validation. It's saying, you know what? Not only is there not going to be any warning, no one's going to get any environmental cues and everyone's going to be stuck there. If everyone is stuck there, that's going to result in this higher life loss. So we, we missed high on our minimum warning here, but we still captured it within our bounds, which I think is really important. All right. Any questions about Kelly Barnes? Yeah. Would you rather this high than this low? Yes, hundred percent. I I think I think that everyone can agree when we're talking about people and lives, we want to miss high so that we can plan for the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you recommend to consider transit population like people at campgrounds or? Yep, transient population is something that comes up often. Um, I'm trying to think if we cover it this week in another presentation. I don't think that we do much, so I'll talk about it now. Um, it depends. So if you're talking about a campground, 
uh, seasonality is very important, right? And um, and how I how I've seen it done, and how I'd recommend it being done by sim is to is you know the campground, you know the camp spots, you know based on the time of year, roughly how many people are going to be in the campground. So you structures pseudo structures that represent tents and give them some very very low maybe human stability criteria for their structural stability throw the, throw a couple of people in there and then that's your structure inventory for your campground it's very that's one's easy what becomes harder is people on water so boaters how do you um, how do you account for somebody who's just downstream of a dam maybe maybe kayaking that becomes much more challenging and that's something we can talk about afterwards uh, homeless is another example is that that's been an issue in LA. Um, that's been a similar thing where I'd recommend it. if you if you know of an encampment where they're going to be. This is the whole part about transient, right? Is you don't there's no fixed location, um, but if you know generally area, you can add dummy structures and and put people there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. For Kelly Barnes, good question. No inundation. Yeah, so so they were the, the there's a small river that runs through there, uh, just downstream of these falls, and it, it was rising a little bit, but it wasn't inundating anybody. It was staying relatively within the banks, and then it just came through as a as a big surprise. Yeah, so there was no pre warning due to yeah. That's a good one though. All right, yeah. Uh, for, for people, if people are like kayaking downstream, yeah, it's really hard, and I don't want to take too much time talking about it because we're towards the end of the day and everything. But it's really hard because how do you determine stability for somebody who's in, in a boat? It, it becomes a bit of a challenge. So I've seen a few different applications um, for people on water. And I'm just nothing. Nothing has come forward yet that's been like that's the one. One is because there isn't a lot of empirical data about people and boats during flooding. There's just not a lot of information out there about that. And two is like it's not a. It's generally not a. Um, it's generally not a decision maker or a decision breaker, if you if you will. Yeah. Good questions though. All right, Mount Passe Dam failure, 1959. This is another big surprise scenario, okay? This is France, 1959, concrete structure. Uh, it's located on the, on the uh, Mediterranean side there, and downstream of the dam is a town called Fréjus, and it's got some history. Big rain, heavy rains coming in. It's a concrete arch structure, so there wasn't a lot of concern at the time, right? Concrete structure, heavy rains kept coming in. Um, Started getting some concerns of the dam, but not major. And then all of a sudden, boom, in the night of December 2nd, a catastrophic, catastrophic failure of the, of the concrete arch caused massive flooding downstream and massive life loss. As you can see, I mean, it's a concrete structure. You can imagine this all went almost instantaneously. Scary stuff. Uh, directly downstream is a canyon. That canyon then eventually fans out into a slightly larger area. Um, the canyon obviously saw the most uh, most devastating of the flows. The water reached the ocean 12 miles downstream in 30 minutes. That's a sense of how fast this flood was moving. That's really cooking. Here's a, a view, visual of the view. So Mount Passe Dam up here in the in the hills. Uh, breaches 30 minutes to get down for town of Fréjus, France. France is right down here. Um, it was, it's the biggest town that was hit by this, but there's population all the way up through here, even in the, even in the, in, in the canyon. All right, what we know. So now we're talking about that model validation piece. Population around 2,500, around 2,500 people at risk. No formal warning like Kelly Barnes, right? This is a, this is a surprise event. No one saw it coming. No one saw it. No one thought this dam was going to fail from this event. There was no warning that went out. Road network again based on historic imagery. Uh, for hydraulics, we have we have we're lucky enough to have two different calibrated models. We have a calibrated Telemec 2D model, 
and a calibrated uh, two-dimensional hydraulic model from RAS. This is great, and this is going to be really fun to talk about because we have two calibrated model, hydraulic models. Should we see the same results? Should, right? We should if they're both calibrated. I guess we'll see if they are the same or not. Um, and then um, we have historic accounts of life loss um, and, and population by different zones. Uh, and we have that over here. So the observed life loss by zones. We're lucky enough to have this information. And then an estimate of the total, pop, total direct fatalities. This number is quite variable, um, but this is the, the number that I guess we're most comfortable with. Uh, and it aligns the most with um, with the documentation we found. For this, we're, we're very fortunate. I think this is the first verification study that we did because um, BC Hydro up in Canada, they developed in the 90s, they developed a piece of software, uh, software program similar to LifeSim, so an agent-based evacuation model. And for their verification, they actually went over to France, worked with a gentleman named Bill Johnstone, and they went over there and they took firsthand accounts and they just did this super deep dive into this failure event to try to get as much information as they possibly could. Uh, we were able to get this information from them, all the shape files, all the population data, all that information, and then it was pretty easy to then convert that over to LifeSim. Quick animation of the flood, just so you can see the Telemec 2D one there. I'll just go back and do that one again. Just really fast. It didn't go quite that fast. This isn't real time. So how do we do? Uh, remember, there are 452 um, fatalities. Now you see three different columns over here. One was that the Telemec 2D model with wood, wood, with the assumption that they're all wood framed houses attached to the foundation. The reason this one's first is because this is the exact same setup that BC Hydro used to verify their model. Okay, they used wood framed housing for their structural stability criteria. Their stability criteria. RAS calibrated model, we see life loss jump up by more than 100 on average. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? They're both calibrated models, so what the heck's going on? Now, this is where it gets really fun, and now we're really going to start throwing some, some monkey wrenches into it. HEC RAS 2D, if we use masonry criteria, uh, gives us a much lower life loss and gets, a little, gets us a little bit closer. The reason this is interesting is because if you look at the uh, structure types of that time, they're almost all masonry. So we start head scratching. Why did, uh, why did the BC Hydro team choose wood stability criteria for their structures? There's two possible reasons. One, their model wasn't giving them the results they wanted, so they switched to wood, right? Um, or, or they, they looked at this, the structures at the time and go, yeah, they're masonry, but they're masonry that was built in, you know, 1800s to, to 1900s, not attached to their foundation, and they're probably going to act a little bit more like wood structures when water is coming in through. So it starts to make a little bit more sense. So when I look at this, I think I can ignore this one, or I can, the masonry structure, okay, I can start to buy that a little bit, and I start looking at these two a little bit more closely. And I start thinking, wow, that's a big difference considering they're both, these are both calibrated hydraulic models. What's, what's up with that? So, but let's, let's look at, if we break it down by these sections, right? The observed life loss in the upper Rayron Valley, that's this little gray area at the top, was 126. Using the Telemet 2D hydraulic model, it only estimates 63. It is way off. It did really well on average, right? But it's not doing well when we start looking at these individuals. The HEC and RAV model did much better, much better. Why is that? It's interesting, talking with the, the group that built the, the RAS model and the group that built the Telemec model, the geo-referencing that they used had a big impact on where the flood occurred up here in the valley. So the Telemec 2D, depths and velocities were actually shifted in the valley because of the projection they used on their data. 
It's really important. Just because a model is calibrated doesn't mean it's accurate. It was calibrated for the grand scheme of things, but that, if they would have, so we played around with that, we did some shifting to try to shift it to be the right location, and the results actually matched up much better up in the valley, but by shifting the entire data set, the results down here, downstream, started getting out of whack. So it's really important to think about what projection system you're in, and when you're looking at your hydraulic results and making sure that your hydraulics are actually capturing the areas that are gonna be inundated. This is a shot of a plot of depths and velocities. And this is the maximum depth and velocity that occurred for every structure in our, in our, um, in our model. The, the, the orange is Telemec, the kind of orangish color. Telemec model, HEC RAS, these are where they all lined up. So for every structure. This is the area of uncertainty about stability. For the wood anchor most likely, sorry, this is the wood anchor most likely on the bottom, and this is the most likely of masonry on the top. So we talked about that importance of the, st uh, the structural stability criteria. Here we can see just how many more structures were added to high hazard by switching from masonry to wood. So every structure that's within this kind of reddish area is an area that would not lose stability in masonry and would lose stability if it's wood. So it's important to think about your structures, the type of stability that they would be, the type of structures they are, and so on. All right, jumping into um, the upper Raylon Valley, uh, looking at a highway work camp. Um, there was a highway work camp, Mount Pesce Dam was just upstream. The highway work camp, uh, the number of workers were uncertain, life losses around 60, population at risk around 96. So this is, they had no warning, and this flood just came through and just completely wiped it out. Uh, that's an area where the RAS model did really well. And like I said, it's because the projection used actually put the water in the right places. And this would be another area where we would actually, where wood makes a lot more sense because it was mostly temporary housing because it was a work camp. Go right across stream and there was a boson mine camp, similar situation. They had a direct path of the flood wave, loss of life around 50, almost everyone that was in that work camp lost their lives, unfortunately. Um, and so this is an area where it just, it's so important to have accurate hydraulics. And just because a model is calibrated when you're doing a consequence assessment, if you, they send you their hydraulic results, don't take them and say, okay, good, this is good. Look at them, make sure they're reasonable and go back to the hydraulic engineer and say, you're wrong, it's okay. You can tell them they're wrong. They might argue, it, eventually, if you're right, they'll eventually acquiesce, I hope. All right, so that's the model validation. I think we did pretty well on model validation when we matched the Telemec model and the, the, the criteria that the BC Hydro team used. If we start playing around with different hydraulic models, that really shows you how um, that hydraulic uncertainty can impact those results. Uh, the life safety model um, doesn't have uncertainty. And I think their estimate was, I, I don't remember, it was low 400s maybe. It wasn't right on the money, obviously, and it shouldn't be. Um, yeah, maybe high 300s, something like that. Okay, so how do we do with our process validation? Our ample warning scenario, much lower life loss, 263. Makes sense, right? If we're modeling this for real, and we don't feel like there would be an ample warning, we feel like it would be a surprise, what about that minimal warning scenario? We, we caught that one really well. Lifeson caught that one really well. But you notice the uncertainty with both of these, way higher than the uncertainty with our, with our model validation, because we knew when the warning went out. We knew roughly that there, no one was gonna get warned, so there's no uncertainty about that warning diffusion. There's no uncertainty about protective action initiation. That's all pretty certain. So that really lowers the uncertainty bands about our, our life loss. But when we go into our process validation in a situation where we don't necessarily know these things, that uncertainty goes through the roof and it should, right? We want to be able to capture that we don't know. We want to be able to say, you know what? If there's ample warning, it could be as low as 31 people that lose their life or it could be as high as 480. Until we get more information, until we get more knowledge, we can start shrinking that uncertainty down by selecting parameters with less uncertainty. All right, so some conclusions. 
Hydraulic model uncertainty can have a big impact on results. You saw that, and that was from two, high, two calibrated models of the same event from two different models. It can have a very big impact on your results. Uh, the structural stability criteria can have a big impact on results as well. We can see the, the difference between using wood versus masonry. If there's uncertainty about that, maybe you want to run both and, and compare and do a little, little bit of checking that way. The reality is that sometimes it might not matter, right? You run with wood, you run with, uh, with masonry, your life loss result changes, but if you're doing a risk assessment, it might not move the dot enough to actually change a decision. So that's something to keep in mind. All right. Um, reality is likely a combination of wood and masonry structures for Malpese, right? That's just the reality. It's not all going to be wood. It's not all going to be masonry. These, this broad blanket statement is likely causing, um, causing our, our model validation to be inaccurate. That we just don't have the information. This was 1955. So we don't have the information about which structures are wood, which structures are masonry. We don't have a uh, Google Earth, unfortunately, doesn't go back that far. So. Um, uncertainty in population at risk and life loss from historic events. I have yet to find a historic event where we know exactly how many people were there. There's always uncertainty about that. And there's always uncertain, some uncertainty about the number of lives lost. Some of them can really shrink that uncertainty down to maybe a couple of people, give or take, right? But I've never seen one that, that knows exactly. So be aware that whenever you're just trying to validate a model, this consequence model, it's going to be uncertainty about what you're validating too. All right, quick check on learning question. LifeSim can sample distributions for all the uncertain input factors that influence potential loss of life from flooding. True or false? False. I heard false. Anybody else? Yeah, I heard, I heard it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jesse. Not, okay, sorry. Uh, yes, false is the right answer. Hydraulic uncertainty, multiple other pieces of uncertainty are not sampled directly in life. And that concludes our first day. So good job, everybody. Hope you enjoyed.